Welcome back to Turning Hard Times and Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor. Really pleased to have Patrick Highsmith with me once again. He is the President and CEO and a Director of Timberline Resources. And uh, he's been on the show a number of times, but uh, for those of you who don't know Patrick, he is uh, over, I guess, around 30 years of experience as an exploration geologist in all areas of the business, actually, um, in the capital markets, as well as uh, just exploring around for household name companies like Newmont and BHP and uh, companies like that. So he's, his background is really, I think, very well suited to lead a junior mining company because he has all these different skill sets that are required uh, to get things moving in a positive direction. And speaking of a positive direction, the company certainly has been doing that with some really good numbers. Assay reports that have come out since the last time we spoke to Patrick um, on May third, I believe it was, and a week or two later come out with uh, some very good news. I'm really pleased to have him on with me. Before I say hello, I should just tell you that it trades uh, in the United States over the counter under the symbol TLRS. You can buy it in Canada. TBR is a symbol there, 159.7 million shares, trading at around 17 cents in U.S. money. If my arithmetic is right, that gives it a market cap of around 27 million in U.S. money. Very low market cap with some exciting potential ahead of uh, ahead of this company. So, uh, Patrick, thank you so much for joining me today. Hello, Jay. Good to be with you. Yeah. Um, so now you you put out some really exciting news uh, on your on your project uh, in Nevada. And um, I think it was May 11th, uh, you put out some news on the Oswego target. Um, b- before I ask you to comment on that, can you talk about, you, you have a, about a half a million ounces in the measured and indicated category already. Uh, the existing resource that you have there, uh, is that related to, is that part of the same system of what you're exploring now? Yes, Jake. Timberline has had since 2013 a National Instrument 43101 uh, reported resource at, at the Lookout Mountain area of the Eureka Project. And it is, as you say, about 500,000 ounces of gold in the measured and indicated category, grading about 0.62 grams per ton. So with those grades, Jay, you can tell that that resource uh, is at surface and it has a significant component of oxide mineralization, which means there may be the potential that that is heap leachable gold. And and that's why when you see a low-grade deposit like that in Nevada at surface, a number of companies, of course, uh, starting back, of course, with the big boys, have advanced those types of grades and tons into uh, into heap leach mines. And if you want to think about that resource as sitting kind of at the surface, um, what we've been drilling at the water well zone and, and has really gotten people excited over the first half of this year with our new results is kind of the, the roots of that, Jay. It's down dip uh, from that resource. There are important faults and structures uh, that uh, may, may in fact sort of have been the feeders into that system that's sitting at the surface. Um, so, yeah, I would say that when folks look back and they see the name, you know, Lookout Mountain, us talking about the Lookout Mountain resource a lot more than sort of the whole Eureka project, it is quite related. What we're drilling at the water well zone is immediately adjacent to, but not inside that resource. So anything mm-hmm. we find at the water well zone will be new tons. And new ounces, you know, hence all the excitement with a number of these, you know, higher grade intercepts, a lot of intercepts greater than five grams per ton, for instance. So, mm-hmm. so yes, uh, the existing resource is related to the exploration we're doing now. However, these would be new tons and, and new ounces that are not included in that. Right. And some of those numbers that I'm looking at, the uh, headline number from your May 18th report on the water well zone, 24.4 meters grading 3.85 grams per ton including 4.6 meters grading 8.35 grams per ton. And, I mean, another, I guess, uh, 7 meters or so grading 5.72 grams per ton. Those are pretty good numbers. Um, you're gonna, I guess you'll probably continue to drill and explore the water well zone this summer. Yes, that, that's the theme for this summer, the lion's share of this summer's work, Jay. And, and we do have two drill rigs out there right now. Uh, at the water well zone. The release you mentioned since we talked on May 18th uh, was really the third core hole that has gone through this zone, uh, this new zone at the water well zone, we call it. And uh, and that was a great intercept, as you said, 24.4 meters at almost four grams per ton. And that just adds on to the really strong results we announced in February and March 
uh, there that were, you know, even thicker and even higher grade than that zone. So mm -hmm. that was the third new core hole into the zone. And that's really helped us define the footprint that we're looking to expand with uh, this summer's drilling. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier than that, on May 11th, you also put out another news release uh, on the Oswego target, which is to the southeast, a long strike, I guess, from the, so you have Lookout Mountain in between then you have the, the water well, and then you have the Oswego target. Also some good numbers there uh, on May 11th. What did you learn from that uh, from that drilling? Yeah, thanks for that, Jay. I'll try to kind of paint a picture that, that folks can understand here, and they can certainly get to our website and see our presentation. But um, the Oswego zone, as you said, it's about a kilometer away from uh, where we've been drilling at the water well zone. And it's not really uh, on strike, Jay. On strike would imply that these faults are kind of connected up uh, in these zones. And what the water well zone is, uh, is kind of a parallel structure to the Oswego okay. uh, structure. So, mm -hmm. however, when folks are looking at our, our corporate presentation, for instance, they can see a cross section, kind of a slice through the earth. Uh -huh. And there you get a feel for the symmetry and what's important about Oswego. Mm -hmm. Oswego is on a structure about a kilometer away, and we did drill some really nice uh, intercepts there. No drill had been there, Jay, in, in, in over 30 years, we think. And we mm -hmm. had the historic data there. We knew uh, there was good grade at surface. Uh, we announced some really impressive surface samples there, uh, a long interval grading 14.5 grams per ton. That was 26 meters, 27 meters of channel samples that graded mm -hmm. 12 grams per ton wow. along this fault. Now, those aren't true thickness. That's just showing you that fault is consistently mineralized. So we needed to drill under it. We did so. And as you say, we hit about 35.1 meters of 2.3 grams per ton, which included, Jay, 19.8 meters of 3.93. Now, what's important about that, Jay, is it was really near surface, so effectively at the surface, right underneath those channel samples we had taken. And the mineralization there was oxide. No. So, again, you know, a lot more testing required, Jay, but it might be amenable to uh, a lower cost form of processing uh, in the future if we turn this into an economic discovery. So if you picture this, you look north on the left side, you have the Lookout Mountain resource, the water well zone with that high grade we've been talking about. And on the right side, you have this Oswego showing with high grade at surface and now a couple of drill holes that hit gold underneath it. And then you can imagine what if those systems kind of connect uh, in that valley at depth and right down the middle of that valley. We've been talking about it for, you know, over a year is this big geophysical anomaly, uh, an IP chargeability anomaly that we finally drill tested and reported earlier in the season that it does have pyrite and other alteration associated with it. It does have a long zone of silver associated with it and some very interesting gold associated with it. So, so really the symmetry of the system implies they could be connected at surface. And that would just make the whole thing a lot bigger, Jay, with, with high grade on each side and maybe a big volume of mineralization down there below. Certainly a lot of potential for that. But meanwhile, this summer, Jay, we're going to drill out the shallow portions of this thing. You know, we're going to drill more at Oswego on that trend, and we're going to drill more at Waterwell. In fact, Waterwell will probably be expanding the Waterwell zone, will probably constitute 60 to 70 percent of our budget for the 2022 drill program, which is already underway. I have to ask you about this uh, silver occurrence um, on the IP anomaly. Is this be a different sort of a mineralization event? Yeah, yeah, we've talked about it before, Jay. These world-class districts, particularly here in Nevada, where you have these major trends, Jay, they continue for miles, and we have multiple producing mines on them, the Carlin trend. Uh, here on the Battle Mountain Eureka trend where we are, those uh, structures are like plumbing. And so what probably happened here is Eureka was made famous for in 1863, I believe it was, 1864, maybe a very significant silver lead zinc discovery. And for a time in the late 1800s, it was the number two silver producer in the country. Now, that system was older, uh, geologically older than the Carlin-type gold that we're currently drilling at the Waterwell Zone or that I-80 gold is drilling up north, for instance. But that mineralization, that silver lead zinc mineralization came in first and probably related to an intrusive rock, a, a granite-type rock down there that we've drilled into, we've confirmed is present in our district. And that long run, it was over 200 meters uh, that ran over 5.2 grams per ton silver. Um, that interval uh, is related to earlier mineralization, to be sure, but it used the same plumbing. 
Jay. So what happens is the Carlin type system. So that system's over a hundred million years old, probably. The Carlin type systems are around 37 to 40 million years old. They came in later and they use the same plumbing and often will find the gold and silver in close proximity to each other. But the rocks look a little bit different and we can usually tell uh, what type of system we're in. But sometimes we do uh, some geochemistry analyze for other elements and that tells us, oh, okay, this has silver lead zinc. That's not a Carlin type system. Um, but the same thing we saw reported from I-80 Gold recently up at their Ruby Deeps project. You see this older system, and then you see the gold system coming in later around it. We see this as a good thing. It tells us this structure is, is, is pumping metal into these rocks multiple times in its geologic history. And uh, world-class deposits tend to do that, Jay. So it just makes us even more excited, even though we're not really chasing a silver mine. You expect to hit some sulfides this year, or uh, I mean, how deep do these oxides go? Yeah, it's a good question. Always, Jay. We we know the water well zone uh, has been yielding sulfide intercepts. Uh, these very high grade intercepts, though, such as the the forty one meters of five grams we reported earlier in the year, the forty four meters of four point one grams, both of which have considerable mineralization over ten grams per ton. We've got about ten samples in there that are running greater than 10 grams per ton. That's all in sulfide mineralization. We can see that when we examine them, Jay, and we also analyze our samples for an additional uh, uh, leach test of the gold to help us determine is it sulfide or is it oxide. So we can see those are sulfide. Across the valley at Oswego, though, uh, as I reported, uh, we've had some oxide there. So we don't predict the oxide to go to great depths, Jay. Um, in our in our Lookout Mountain resource, there's certainly oxide. We did some preliminary metallurgical test work uh, that indicates that, that some of that material may be leachable. So it's hard to say, Jay. I wouldn't expect it to go uh, certainly uh, more than 20 or 30 meters below surface uh, in great abundance. But there are tons out there. We do find oxide deeper than that. And it just takes a lot of hard work. Uh, keep drilling, keep doing rigorous analyses and, and paying careful attention to the mineralogy. And we'll know what we've got uh, as we proceed with the resource uh, development. And that'll be clear. We update the resource. We'll certainly be making clear to folks, uh, you know, whether this is oxide or sulfide. We always note in our press releases, for mm-hmm. instance, Jay, when we drill oxide. Sure. Uh, well, the Ruby Hill mine to the north, not very far away from your project, uh, I mean, it had some pretty spectacular numbers coming out of there as well, I think. Do you see this as a – is it very similar geology? Is it, or is it the same or what? Yeah, great great question. As I said, we're we're doing exploration in Nevada on trend. Okay, mm-hmm. we're not uh, we're not out you know in the middle of nowhere yeah. hoping there's gold here. Yeah. And uh, we look at the Eureka District as uh, a really significant uh, gold district, Jay. And that's kind of news to the world. When I eighty Gold acquired the Ruby Hill Mine, they of course set about preparing a technical report. And in that, they disclosed all the historic work that had been done there as well as their own work. And they announced at that time that this uh, project contains 7.8 million ounces, I believe it is, in indicated and inferred ounces of gold resources. Now, prior to that, there had been historic production of 1.8, 1.5 million ounces of gold by both Homestake and Barracks. So, you know, almost over 9 million ounces right there. Now, um, if you follow south from there, we're the dominant claim owner in the district. Uh, we have around 57 percent, I think, of the of the tenements in this district. So we're the biggest tenement holder. And if, as you come south from there, about four kilometers, you get into our project and uh, we straddle us and I-80J. We straddle this this sort of corridor of rocks that are Cambrian to Ordovician in age. They are shales, dolomites and limestones. And those make potentially good hosts for Carlin type deposits. And this corridor comes right out of I-80's ground, south uh, into our ground. And we share what we're calling the Eureka Gold Belt, sort of straddled on this belt of rocks. And they're, of course, much more advanced than we. They're drilling these 600 meter holes down into the Ruby Deeps and their other projects up there. And, of course, there's a sizable you know, gold mine on their property that Homesake and Barrick operated. 
but we're more in the exploration stage. But we've added already 500,000 ounces of resources to the picture. There's historic production on our property from both windfall and lookout that that add up to, you know, about 120,000 ounces or 25,000 ounces, something like that. When you add all that up, this is clearly a 10 million ounce district, Jay. Very similar setting for what we're drilling. Some of the exact same host rocks that host gold at Ruby Hills Project, host gold at, um, at our project. And we believe this district's just going to explode with potential. We, we think there could easily be more than 20 million ounces in this district. And uh, it's just really exciting to see who's going to drill out those resources. And with those great uh, drill results from I-80 and the strong results we've had in the first half of this year, we think uh, this part of Nevada is one of the hottest places to explore. Yeah, it sure seems like it. And you have a lot of, uh, you, you have permission to do a lot of drilling there too, I think. Permits in place, right? Yeah, very important to note. We have a plan of operations with over 250 permitted drill sites. Jay, it's ongoing work to keep updating that permit to, to do concurrent reclamation with your work. It's a sizable project out there. Uh, right now, and uh, there's no uh, sort of uh, constraints on us drilling this year uh, based on permitting, for sure. We've already gotten busy uh, with two rigs turning as we speak. And you're well-funded, I believe, uh, Patrick, to carry you through uh, this year's program? The program we've launched is fully funded. Uh, we raised uh, just under $4.8 million, ounces, a million dollars, uh, U.S., Jay, in, uh, in May and announced that, so, uh, or in April, May. And so, yeah, fully funded for this program, and we can just focus on getting out there and drilling holes and, and reporting the news back to you and the market. Who knows? It might be 4.8 million ounces. It was a slip <laughs> of the tongue, a Freudian slip, I suppose. But nonetheless, um, this is a kind of district where that is possible. We're not we're not promising anything, folks, but it's early stages. But what should investors be looking out for, potential share price drivers? Well, we've just announced today, Jay, the, the uh, kind of a summary of the program for 2022. We're going to drill uh, uh, you know, approximately 6,000 meters or so, between five and 6,000 meters, I would say. A lot of that will be core drilling around the water well zone, probably, as I said, 60 to 70 percent of the focus there. And news flow will start in, in the late summer. The labs are quite backed up. Um, we've got a few little things going on. There may be some news flow across the summer with uh, some earlier stage exploration results from some of our other work or a little property acquisition here or there as we take care of our uh, of our land position. But I would say late summer, the new slow will really begin. Uh, some of the first holes will be from the water well zone for sure. But we'll, we'll be returning to Oswego and we'll be testing this. We'll be really stretching out this drilling, following up on that high grade. Uh, things are just kind of wide open, as folks can see from the map we put in the news release. There's a lot of room and uh, we're going to be testing that. So uh, great news flow across the summer, particularly picking up in the late summer. Jay. All right. We'll certainly be uh, looking forward to watching it, keeping an eye on it. Thank you so much, Patrick, for updating us, and uh, we'll look to do it again sometime in the future.